We are going to concentrate on one playwright, perhaps the best known playwright, at least in all of the English speaking world, William Shakespeare. 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 Shakespeare is a classic in our time. We know him to be one of the greatest poets and playwrights. But what do the people of the 18th century think of him? And that is what we are going to be taking a look at today. For while Shakespeare is from about 150 years before this time, dies in the year of uh, 16 and 16, he is still enjoyed in the 18th century, but at being quite a bit old by this time, his works are seen as classic, as very good, but sometimes a bit long-winded, sometimes a bit wordy, sometimes a bit convoluted in their language. All of these thoughts that we might have about Shakespeare in our modern day are ones I promise you people have had before. And so in the 18th century, we see many adaptations, revisions, and rewrites of William Shakespeare for an 18th century audience, uh, playing to the different likes, those different fashions, what they enjoy to see at the Playhouse, is how we are going to adapt Shakespeare. And so today, specifically, we are going to look at some of those changes. Some of these changes are very small, ones that we would not even blink <coughs> at in our modern day where we see long plays that are merely trimmed down, extra characters and plot lines merely plucked out of the play so the running time isn't about five hours. <laughs> we see other changes, slightly larger changes. We see entire plot lines from plays being concentrated on and everything else being thrown away to fit in a short hour and a half time period. We start to see even larger changes take place here in the 18th century. We see music being added to plays where there were none. We see music being added to tragedies. If we think that Sondheim was original with the West Side Story, no, no, people of the 18th century had the ability and certainly added music to some of Shakespeare's greatest tragedies. We start to see even larger changes. In fact, we see entire endings rewritten. Are we all familiar with the tragedy of King Lear? Yes. yes, yes, we've at least heard of that great tragedy. Well, if you spoke to someone of the 18th century, they'd be a bit confused by that. For they know King Lear and they're familiar with the play. But it is not a tragedy, for it was rewritten to have a happy ending. <laughs> Never good characters rewarded and the bad are punished. Unless you think this is a bit odd, I assure you, this, this version was not popular just in the 18th century but in the 19th century as well. And you could even still find it some places in the very early parts of the 20th century. And so today we are going to look at those changes. And not just those changes that are happening over in London, but those changes that are happening here in America. How Shakespeare comes here to the colonies. And to look at Shakespeare here in the colonies, we ought to look at the first professional company that comes here. For there was man, William Hallam, who had managed a theater in London, Goodman's Fields Theater, and he was not doing too terribly well, so he came up with an idea to send, instead of sending his <coughs> actors to this oversaturated market of the London stages, he instead decides to send his younger brother, who is in charge of a small company across the Atlantic, to hear this untapped market of the colonies. Here they come, and it is Lewis Hallam Sr., his wife, who is the leading lady of that company, their three children, and ten other actors that come across and f arrive first not up to New York, not to William, or not to Philadelphia, but right here in Williamsburg. And that is where we have our first evening of professional theater. We know that those actors travel up and down the colonies performing those greats of Shakespeare. We know that the two <coughs> most performed tragedies here in all of the colonies in all of America, it was Richard III and Romeo and Juliet. Once again, this is not the Romeo and Juliet that you are quite familiar with. It is one that was actually rewritten by David Garrick. And apparently David Garrick thought the ending was a little too sad for an 18th century audience. For we all know the ending of Romeo and Juliet. To have Romeo hearing of his wife's death comes to her, finding her dead, so distraught takes poison, dies. She wakes up, finding her husband dead next to her, so upset, takes his dagger, kills herself, and everybody cries. <laughs> Not quite the case in the 18th century. Instead, we have Romeo hearing of his wife's death, comes, finds her dead, takes poison. She then wakes up, they have a few words, he seems to remember that he just took poison, promptly dies, she, so distraught, takes his dagger, kills herself, everybody cries. You get the same body count at the end of the play, <laughs> but they're at least allowed those few words until they meet each other on the other side. <laughs> and so we see these revisions throughout the colonies. But let's take a look at that very first performance, for we do know that those actors arrive here and have their first professional performance 
right here in Williamsburg on September 15th of 1752. And what play do they begin with? But none other than The Merchant of Venice. Of course, another great of Shakespeare's. But we know it is not just a great first for Shakespeare here in America. It's not just a great first for professional actors here in America. It is a great first for that family as well. For as I've already mentioned, Sarah Hallam, the wife of the manager, was the leading lady of that company, so she was to play the lead of Portia. But her oldest son, Louis Hallam Jr., at 12 years of age, was to have his debut upon the stage that day. He was playing the servant of Portia, so he merely needed to come out, stand next to his mother, deliver a few lines, receive applause, and walk off. <laughs> well, we know that it did not go quite according to plan. <laughs> but young Lewis Hallam Jr. on that day came out here upon the stage, stood out next to his mother, looked out over the crowd, was struck with such an acute sense of stage fright that he burst into tears and ran off the stage crying. Oh. As if that wasn't bad enough, they wrote about it in the paper later on that oh. week. If that isn't bad enough, we still talk about it here too much. <laughs> 